This is Scott Morgan with the uh, BTC Journal. And today's panel discussion is on privacy and law enforcement. And we have some panels with us that will definitely talk, talk upon that subject. And as everybody knows, it's, there's, there's some recent actions that have happened that have kind of put this all into our, our focal point. So we'll, of course, cover those topics as well. Uh, just a couple of rules of order, so to speak, is we'd like you to hold your applause or booze to the end. Um, if you have questions, feel free to line up after when we have a question, a Q&A session at the microphone, because I've been told that if you want to get on the actual transcript, it's best to go up there so I don't have to paraphrase your question. You can actually ask, ask it correctly. Um, this whole session is going to be taped video and taped audio, so just be aware of that. And uh, we look forward to having your input as well, because that's the whole reason why we're here, to get that part of the feedback and probably have more questions than I have. We're crowdsourcing this, so we look forward to your input. Um, to start off, I'm going to let each one of the panelists here um, introduce themselves, because they be, would do a much better introduction of themselves than I will. And if you have any questions, again, just wait until the end, and uh, we will definitely try to get as many questions in as we can. Thank you. So I'd like to start to my right here. and. Can you up? Sure. So my name is Jerry Brito. Uh, I'm a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Uh, Mercatus is an economic research center at the university. Um, what we try to do is take market-oriented ideas in the academy and be a bridge from with those ideas to policy making and people on the hill and regulators. And uh, I'm director of the technology policy program at Mercatus. And so what I try to do is uh, be a resource to regulators and folks on the Hill um, uh, about how to think about technology issues. My name is Rob Benigali. I'm CEO and co-founder of a startup called Glyph, and it is a digital identity platform. But what it does is it allows you to send text messages securely, and we announced yesterday that we now integrate Bitcoin payments. So you could be having a conversation with someone securely in our app, and then you can send them Bitcoin in line. So we help people protect their transactions, not just the payments themselves, but the context or the social context around it. I'm Rainy Reitman. I'm with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, EFF is a nonprofit civil liberties law firm and advocacy center. Uh, we do impact litigation around civil liberties in the digital space. We also do advocacy work to uh, help people understand how new technologies can affect our basic rights. Um, I wanted to, I'm going to take a slightly longer intro uh, because I, I, as we go into this panel, I, I thought I would lay a couple things out. Um, I'm not a lawyer. Um, I'm not a technologist. I have a technologist over here. Raise your hand, Seth. He knows the answer to all your technical questions. And <laughs> um, I, I really wanted to come here today because for the last two years I've been tracking cases of financial censorship. So cases where people's accounts are shut down, often due to the type of speech that they are holding. Uh, in many of these cases I have been able to um, directly intervene with the payment processors or at least have a conversation about why they did, made those policy decisions. Sometimes I was able to get it reversed, sometimes I was able to get it reversed and be public about it, um, uh, as in the case of, for example, the Bradley Manning Support Network having their PayPal account shut down, Smashwords having their PayPal account shut down. Sometimes uh, I am able to get it reversed and I can't talk about it. Uh, and sometimes I can't get it reversed at all, but my goal, my ultimate goal is for everybody in this room um, to think of me when they run into financial censorship issues. I would love to be able to collect this information and map this space in a useful and meaningful way uh, because EFF is planning on uh, publishing in the next year or so uh, sort of a larger policy document about this issue specifically. Uh, I've already started to see some really uh, concerning trends and uh, hopefully, as the panel goes on, I can start to talk about some of those things. Um, I know that the panel topic is financial privacy and law enforcement. I'm here to talk about censorship, so <laughs> please bear that in mind also with some of the questions. I'm very intrigued by financial privacy and law enforcement. I'd love to hear about it. Uh, I'm ha but the issue I have been tracking is specifically account shutdowns for political speech, for uh, speech that people find controversial. So, thanks. Um, my name is Joe, Joe Cutler, and I'm, a, I'm counsel at Perkins Coie, a law firm. It's a national law firm. We're based out of Seattle, um, but we've got offices around the country. And uh, our electronic uh, financial services 
uh, department uh, is chaired by Dax Hansen, who, who, chair, or who spoke on the panel before me. And uh, I'm a litigator. I, I actually sit in the litigation group. We have a unique group there that spans both the business and the um, litigation groups. And our privacy and data security group really kind of annexes what I like to call sort of the, the, three, the three legs of the stool. You know, you have um, electronic financial services, product privacy, and data security. And then we counsel and we litigate on both sides of that, of that topic. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to direct my first question to Jerry. And uh, just recently here, um, May 18th, we had the um, U.S. Uh, CENFIN, or the, FIN, the Financial Center for Crimes Enforcement, um, we had them issue some guidance on virtual currency. Now, we all knew they probably mean Bitcoin. Um, and then weighing in just a month later here in May um, comes the uh, Commodity Futures Trading Commission stating that, you know, this is not monopoly money, you know, we're going to have to take a look at this thing. Um, you know, what type of future regulation, um, including the type and severity, uh, to Bitcoin do you expect to see in the near future? Right. So I think that um, FinCEN is still um, where the action is, um, simply because uh, I think the last panel did a very good job of explaining what is happening with Vincent and what is happening uh, with Mt. Gox specifically. And one thing that um, the, pan the last panel explained, I think it was Dax who was explaining it, uh, is that the seeming prosecution of uh, uh, Mt. Gox is not based on the guidance. It's based on um, uh, uh, sort of uh, false statements on the bank form. So we have yet to see the guidance be enforced. Um, and we have yet to see, see the guidance be um, enforced to different classes of people, right? So exchanges being one that's pretty clear that they need to comply um, uh, with FinCEN registration and state uh, licensing. But then you have miners and you have regular users. So the, sort of the, the, the question marks are still out on that. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned uh, uh, the CFTC. Yes. That's very interesting. Um, I'll note that it was one commissioner who made that statement. With great uh, hair, by the way. Yes. Uh, he is a bit of a flamboyant uh, person who um, uh, like, seems to like attention, this particular commissioner. Uh, so uh, folks who I've talked to who followed the CFTC tell me it's not surprising that he would make such a statement. So again, I would, I would point out that's one commissioner. I would point out that the CFTC uh, regulates commodities futures. They don't regulate commodities. So to the extent that there are Bitcoin futures markets, as I think there are some nascent ones, that might come under the CFTC. Um, then you also might have SEC um, regulation. It, you know, it's a stretch to, to think of Bitcoin as a security. You can imagine some making uh, that case. Um, finally, you have potential CFPB, uh, uh, Consumer Financial uh, Protection uh, Bureau, which is sort of, this is a brand new federal bureau um, that may take an interest in this uh, as more consumers get involved uh, with Bitcoin as so sort of consumer protection. Um, and finally, Congress is the wild card here. Um, you know, we've had some offhanded sort of remarks um, by members of Congress, some who are, uh, anyhow, I won't characterize it, but um, in general, though, uh, uh, folks on the Hill are not aware of Bitcoin and don't understand it, um, but they're starting to, to hear about it. Mm -hmm. My message that I'll just like to get on, on the table here today is I am very optimistic about the regulatory climate for Bitcoin, despite everything that you hear and everything that you see, because I think that um, the regulators and folks on the Hill simply don't understand it. Um, as much as you uh, don't understand the regulations and are trying to you know, go through this fog of war to try to comply, mm -hmm. they are trying to fit you into their existing buckets. And you and Bitcoin is very confusing uh, to them. Um, but the potential is there to come to an understanding to allow Bitcoin uh, to flourish. And what that is going to involve is a lot of education and dialogue uh, between the Bitcoin community, folks trying to b build businesses based on Bitcoin, and uh, folks uh, that are regulators or uh, the, you know, on the Hill. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Ray, my next question is to you. Um, you know, it appears that, you know, again, Bitcoin is rush, or maybe not rush, to perhaps gain legit legitimacy and more of a, a payment network system. You've just had a recent announcement from PayPal saying, well, we may look into taking Bit 
you know, this Bitcoin thing um, as payment. Um, part of the question is, since they're considered really a money services business, the MSB, um, do you think it should be their responsibility to tell Bitcoin, if they decide to accept Bitcoin, do you think it should be their responsibility to basically communicate to Bitcoin users or any users that they may be actually giving up some of their privacies or other, um, you know, advantages that were actually in part of the actual contemplation of the Bitcoin system? Do you think there should be some kind of a disclosure by them on that behalf, saying, you know, their accounts may be frozen, where if you use your own private wallet, it wouldn't? What's your thought on that? So I have a couple thoughts on that. I think that, as most people in this room know, and as I'm sure you know, PayPal has drifted a lot away from its original really libertarian roots so that now it is an extremely well-regulated entity. Uh, and what we've seen is many cases in which they're shutting down accounts of people uh, with very little uh, recourse for those individuals to get their money back, uh, and it's become a, a major point of contention for users of PayPal, and you see this on many of the PayPal forums that are out there. Um, so the question is, if PayPal is going to integrate Bitcoin to an extent, well, should they have some sort of disclosure that says, you know, subject to uh, the agreements you sign on to when you get an account with us, we'll be able to seize your money. And I think that, uh, and perhaps Joe can speak to this even better. The agreements that you sign on to when you start an account with anybody give them basically all of your power and, and rights, and they, you, you're handing them everything. And you're, they're handing you these legal documents that most people can't understand, um, much less have the, the time or ability to even sit down and read every single one of them when they sign up for an account. And at that point, uh, you know, should... PayPal have an obligation to insert into those legal documents yet another sentence that says, and also we can seize your accounts even if you're using Bitcoin. Um, I think it's th that even if that is you know something they ought to do, it doesn't fix anything. It fixes nothing. The problem is that um, is that uh, PayPal as a financial intermediary, like many financial intermediaries. Uh, has the ability to shut down accounts with the ramification of shutting down uh, websites and different forms of speech. Uh, that's the, that's the long-term implication of what the decisions these you know, companies are making. So just putting a notification when you sign up for an account isn't actually fixing the root of the problem. It doesn't actually get the speech back up online. It doesn't actually get those websites the funds that they need. That's kind of my two cents on it. No, that's right. Could I, could I add? Please. Uh, you know, it's interesting because at this conference, you know, uh, the people that I've met who I didn't know and, and the clients of ours who we do know, I mean, they would like nothing more than to launch their service with no terms, right? <laughs> right? I mean, to, to not have to put privacy disclosures and to not have to have legalistic documents. Um, and, you know, part of, the, part of the craft of being a lawyer is trying to find a way to help entrepreneurs um, get their service up and running, unencumbered by either the risk associated with having terms or um, the challenge or the money or the time or the, 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 the lost user experience that comes with putting up terms. On the other hand, you know, they don't have a choice in some respects. You know, the, if you think about, I mean, let's frame the privacy issue. I don't want a repeat of the panel we just had. So the privacy issue comes from a different set of legal regimes. This isn't MSB regulation that's causing the privacy problems. Right? I mean, financial privacy comes from things like Graham Leach Bliley, and it comes from things like the FTC, who is concerned about regulating privacy and, and data. And um, you know, Section 5 of the FTC Act, whether you want to lobby against it or protest against it or speak against it, still requires businesses that are engaged in commerce to do two things. They can't engage in unfair business practices, and they can't engage in deceptive trade practices. And, and, and the, the, the trick is, if you're going to take people's information, so think of how this comes together. You've got the MSB laws or the AML laws that require you to know your customer. That means you've got to collect people's data. You've got to collect their information, sometimes their social security number, their identity. And as soon as you do that, then the FTC's Section 5 Act engages. And the FTC is going to look for you to do two things. If you do have a privacy policy, it will be a deceptive trade practice for you to do something different than what that says, mm -hmm. which is why the lawyers fret so much about every word, because they want to make sure that your practice matches your, 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 your speech. 
If you choose not to put a privacy policy up or to be completely opaque about what you do, you run the risk of running afoul of the other prong of the Section 5 Act, which is a, 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 an unfair business practice, meaning that you didn't tell people what you were going to do and you did what you wanted with it. And so you're sort of, you know, screwed if you do, screwed if you don't. There's, there's not a lot you can do other than try to comply. So I, I guess as a lawyer, you know, I, I respect and I appreciate the, you know, the criticism that, that terms are hard, that they're complicated, that people don't read them. Um, but I can tell you in practice, as a practicing lawyer who drafts and edits and revises terms, I try very, very hard to make them clear, make them simple, make them short, and make the user experience pleasant for the user. And, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't want to say this too lightly, but at some level, you know, consumers are people, and consumers are consumers, and consumers should read. They should. They don't, and that's okay. But at the end of the day, if you're going to entrust a service with, you know, half your life savings, and you don't read it, it, sure, the company should try to make it as clear and transparent as they can, but at some level, consumers do have responsibility. And, and, you know, and nowhere but financial services is that more acute because they really have something to lose. Well, if I can just push back. So I actually agree with a lot of what you said there. And I, you know, having talked to a lot of different companies about their privacy policies, I think, you know, that, that's a fair assessment that often they're not trying to do the wrong thing. They just don't want to get themselves in the legal hot water. I would say two things that I've kind of noticed with companies is one, that the law, and maybe you can even speak to this a little bit, especially things like know your customer, there's a little flexibility in how you want to interpret that and whether or not you want to take the most aggressive interpretation possible or if you want to do something that's a little more privacy respecting and rights respecting and err on the side of uh, potentially standing up for speech and standing up for privacy uh, and, and put yourself out there a little bit. And what I, what I, and the other thing I've seen is some companies, for example, Stripe, adopt really powerful transparency around, uh, for example, when they're shutting off accounts and when they are uh, receiving requests from the government to shut down accounts. And so I think that um, companies choosing uh, to be bold and stand up to the extent possible by law is something we should encourage, but we don't really have a method of doing that because the average consumer has no way to really uh, look at a series of different banking enterprises and decide which ones are actually going to stand up for their rights. And, uh, and the, the, the one thing that we've actually seen start to percolate up is these transparency reports. And I think we're just sort of starting to see that at, at its, you know, we've got Stripe doing it, but we really don't have anybody else in that field right now. Can I say to that? Yes. Um, I think that you're absolutely right. And I, uh, I think, however, that even if you had a uh, firm that was looking to compete based on their privacy protections, you would still end up with the loads of terms that nobody would read anyway. So that, that's one. And the way you get around that, we say, well, how, is, how are people, how are consumers going to be able to know which one to pick? Well, they're going to compete on that. So um, firms, if they want to go out on a limb, um, and put themselves out there in order to have this competitive advantage, they're going to advertise that. And so I think, I think that's fine. And I think you'll, you'll get a good mix of both. Maybe cheaper ones that are not as privacy protective, maybe more expensive ones that are more privacy protective. So you think the actual market may, may determine financial freedom per se because somebody's going to react to that? To the extent that there is a wiggle room that right. Rainy says there is. I, I think that's such a fantastic idea. I wish it would work. <laughs> maybe there is a wiggle room. the market room. Will, will correct itself. And maybe that's what's so interesting about Bitcoin, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's why we're all here. Is like, is this something that can push the market in the right direction? And, you know, it's certainly the thing that gets me very excited about it. Um, but, you know, at least in my experience, it's been very frustrating uh, seeing companies and banking institutions choose overwhelmingly the conservative, anti-rights, anti-privacy practices. So, it's, it's, it's actually yeah, it's an open discussion. It definitely is like most of this is, unfortunately. And the next question I have is on law enforcement because again, it's kind of an open question. We just saw Mount Gox, and you can you who knows how, what's going to actually play out here. But the point is that the first thing that um, the Homeland Security, um, what a fascist name to me, but <laughs> that's just my libertarian roots coming up. Um, Homeland Security goes ahead and they, they issue, not to wallet because I guess they serve in the United States and also the LLC that you know, Mount Gox has in Delaware, um, a seizure notice. So it, you know, it kind of goes beyond probably what it could have been a cease and desist. Okay, but there's a seizure notice, fine. I guess my question to you, Rob, 
for instance, would be you're running Glyph, mm -hmm. and uh, Glyph is, is is a great piece of software. I, I run it. It's not just a plug. Mm -hmm. I enjoy it a lot. Thanks. Um, and it gives you that ability to hopefully talk with people in an encrypted format. Mm -hmm. My fear always is that when you talk in any kind of format which is encrypted, you're, you may be under this guise of being labeled, some, you don't want to be labeled, such as terrorism, it's a word that's been thrown around a lot, it seems to stick to a lot of people unfairly, maybe fairly. What if law enforcement, you know, federal, state, whomever you want to break it down, comes to your door, knocks and starts opinion records for me? I mean, how are you going to react to something like that? What are you going to do? That's a good question. So what you, I think you're speaking to is that when you're sending Bitcoin payments, there's also communication that's going on about the payments themselves. So we have a privacy issue that isn't just around uh, being able to protect the ability to continue to send and receive funds, but also the fact that you need to talk about the transaction or the payment that you're going to process. So. That's something that we're very interested in, Nick Force, and I think that uh, writing our privacy policy is quite robust and easy to read, if you'd like to read it. But uh, one thing that you have to be aware of is, what if the conversations that describe the payments that you're sending are subpoenaed, as you're mentioning? And if somebody comes to our door and asks that, uh, you know, our data is encrypted, uh, but we would, by law, we're based in the United States, need to turn that over. Uh, one thing that uh, can be done is, uh, there are technical, some technical solutions to this, and for example, uh, in our service, we currently encrypt all data between users, but we also have to offer password reset. So we have to offer a way, for most normal people sometimes forget their passwords. But uh, one thing that we can do is allow people to turn off password resets. So we've got this, we we'll call it lockdown privacy protection. But by removing the ability to reset your password, mm -hmm. uh, if you lose your password, your data is lost. However, in addition to that, the positive side is if your data is subpoenaed from us, uh, we can feel very comfortable turning it over uh, because it's protected by AES-256 encryption. So they would need to find a way to either find your password or break that. So one, one way to, to handle a situation like that as far as a subpoena would be would be allow a technical means for the user to protect themselves. So you would, you would stand in the, the superior um, and mm -hmm. legal position by saying, well, we don't have access to somebody's password. It's called their password. And they voluntarily said, we don't want to reset our passwords. We have no idea how to get this information. You need to subpoena them directly if you can find who they are. Yeah, you need to find a way to compel them to give you their password. And I don't think that you can do that right now. Yeah, this, is, a, yeah, this is an area of law that we, that we are, are very deep in. And it's a, it's a challenging issue. There's you know, the communications you're speaking of could could very likely be governed by, like, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, which um, is a, a very complicated piece of law. With, In the middle of an update. Yeah, and 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 we'll see we'll see where it lands. But I, I will say that that um, you, the beginning of your question sort of leaned like, what are you going to do about it? Like, do you have a choice? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, and I think that, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about Douala's circumstance. I mean, you don't really have a choice in some respects, you know, there. But so there's two sides of the coin. One is if, if the government comes with, um, you know, the proper due process, they've gotten the warrant, they have probable cause, they have the right, they've cited the right stuff, they've dotted the right I's and crossed the right T's, they're going to get the information. Um, on the other hand, there are few other entities that are entitled to that information in that amount of breadth. And, and what, I, what I think that um, if you make a comparison to social media companies, mm -hmm. you know, social media companies and internet providers have made a very strong and robust practice of resisting process. And, you know, we've got a team of lawyers at Perkins that, that spend almost their whole practice going around the country quashing subpoenas. And, and resisting motions to compel them to give information. So I actually, I actually don't think that all companies are just rolling over and giving people data. I, I can attest to that. You know, our clients are very principled about giving the government the very minimum that they have to when they're compelled by proper due process and only, and, I mean, I've had, I've had lawyers who've been threatened with jail time because they go to the judge and say, we will not provide it. And you know, you kind of sign up for that when you become a lawyer. The one element I wanted to touch on, though, is this idea that you would purposely design a system that is unsubpoenable. <laughs> um, all I can say is that that is a hotly debated legal question whether that's okay to do. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm not saying it's right. And, and, and I think most of us have come down on the side that if you have another commercial <coughs> purpose for it, and the sole intention is not designing something to circumvent a, a, a legal process, like a warrant, 
um, there's probably a defensible way to do that. But, but I, I would hope that we wouldn't leave this discussion thinking that, oh, as long as I design you know, the kill switch in a way that can get me out of legal process, I'm good. Um, what might happen in that sense is that you would suffer the penalties of, of you know, contempt of court. And, and so I just, you know, <laughs> it's, it's a great technology and, and we've had several clients in different spaces approach it like, well, what if we just, you know, basically throw the password away and say, well, we can't do it. And the, the challenge is, is, is you need to also be able to say that means I can't service the account. I have no other maintenance methods. There's no other possible way. Because the truth is, is that in, in other contexts, the government can come and send an agent to your office and sit over your shoulder and make you do it. Use your back-end maintenance tool. Use your, your mirrored backup database that may not have the loss of the password. So um, when, when you decide to offer customers a, a pre-designed way and market it as, you certainly don't want to put this as subpoena proof. I'll tell you that. <laughs> but you know. Just thinking through those legal issues, that's, that's tricky ground. Yeah, sure. I, to respond Randy, to that, or, or oh, you want to? I was going to say that, just that I, if we're going to offer something like this, one definitely wouldn't be labeled that way. But also, it'd be, uh, <laughs> it's, really, <laughs> it's really about offering privacy, not only from a subpoena, but also the potential of a data loss. So mm -hmm. I mean, we're not perfect, and bad things do happen. Um, they don't. But uh, if there was a leak, it'd be important that you wouldn't want some of these accounts, if you didn't want your account to potentially be, uh, if the database was owned or something, that there would be a master password for your particular account. And so really this is not only protection potentially from uh, a law enforcement or something of that nature, but also in the unfortunate event of a hack. The, the really good thing, one last little thing, the good thing about that approach is, you know, the, the argument we make like 99% of the time when we go to quash a subpoena is, look, we're the service provider. Go talk to the user. Mm -hmm. if, if you want the data, they have access to it. Go subpoena them. The, the fact that they're resistant is not my problem. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's the very powerful argument, which is, and, and you know, companies are winning those arguments around the country right now. I just want to throw one little thing in here right now, and that is I agree with Joe that this is a hotly debated issue right now. Mm -hmm. One of the places it's going to be debated in the next year is Congress. Congress has passed, um, Congress is in the middle of updating the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. Uh, and the question right now during that update is whether or not we have some sort of emergency exceptions included in the final version or as far as you know whether or not warrants are necessary for certain things. I think there, there is a really strong argument to be made that service providers are stepping up to the bat and overwhelmingly pushing back on law enforcement and saying come back with a warrant. And law enforcement is even starting to get to that point where they're like well, it seems, you know, they will just get a warrant. And so I think there's also this, but there's this question of, well, do we need an update to these outdated laws? And the question is, yes, but can we do it in a way that doesn't actually make it worse? Uh, I think the other thing that we have is the FBI uh, uh, going to Congress and going to various representatives and going to the White House and saying, oh, encryption, we just can't get access to the stuff that we need, we're, we're desperately behind technology, we're going dark, that's their phrase, we're going dark. We won't be able to uh, crack down on crimes anymore. Now if you look at the numbers of times in a year that the FBI is actually completely thwarted by, um, by encryption, it's, uh, it's uh, shockingly low. Nonetheless, they have continued to push this line that they are um, that they are having frustrations with this, which means that I think in the next year, possibly the following year, but probably this year, we're going to see a piece of legislation introduced to update CALEO, which is the Communications Assistance to Law Enforcement Act. So I wanted to float that to you guys so that when it comes up in the news and on the EFF site, you think, oh, Communications Assistance to Law Enforcement Act, that's that, uh, that's that update could, could have major consequences for how service providers are forced to uh, make their systems more accessible to law enforcement. And this is the time when we're really going to have to hone in on that question of just how accessible does a company have to make their services? Where's the right ethical line? Where's the right technological line? Where's the right legal line there? And it's a hard question, but one that I am really nervous. If we're not, as a community, extremely engaged on it, it's going to go really the wrong direction. And we're going to end up with uh, automatic, you know, pre-wired for wiretapping systems. And that would be, the, in my mind, a, a pretty big loss for uh, the, the internet, you know, sort of community, which I think ultimately service providers, as Joe said, should be neutral. They should be platforms that 
data passes through rather than uh, places where you can censor and shut down speech. Very good point. Um, before we get to, to questions, because I think we should leave the space open for some some time for, for adequate questions. And again, if you if you wanted to ask a question, you can probably start lining up now. Um, and just make sure you speak into the microphone because that way you can be on tape. We can. I won't have to repeat your question again because we got only a certain amount of time here. So I apologize. Let me let me end here with with this group. Unless you know there's not enough questions, and we'll get back to some more questions. But let's take a collaborative question. And the collaborative question I have is what you talked about, Randy, and what you talked about, Joe and Rob. Well. What kind of collaborative effort do you know of, um, besides you know us meeting here? But what kind of collaborative effort do you see that's trying to promote Bitcoin? To try to talk to legislative people who don't know what this is and automatically assume it's a tariff network because one tenth of one percent goes to the Silk Road and buys you know cycle bins. What, what are we actually doing here? We're not we're not law enforcement. We've got 45, 50, 60 different environments and departments, and we there's no way we can always get together and agree on something. But we all have, let's face it, an economic you know, good thing here because we all want to hopefully profit from something which is good, which brings in our greed and fear factor. But also, how do we protect ourselves and how do we get our group together and collaboratively and then basically approach lawmakers on the state level, the federal level, whatever, and let them know, here are our talking points and these are things that we're going to basically consider important. Have a, I got something quick. Uh, so I posted actually on Bitcoin Talk. I created a thread and I said, uh, hey, I think it would be great if uh, we start reaching out to some of our elected representatives. Uh, so I put some links uh, so if you could find your representative, your district first, and then uh, you could contact them. Do you want to say what that, the website did? Oh, this is on Bitcoin Talk. So this is just a thread on one of the Bitcoin discussion forums. Mm -hmm. And uh, interestingly, the, the immediate feedback wasn't, uh, oh, I'm going to, I said, uh, I went ahead and did that. I wrote my representative and said, I think you should educate yourself on Bitcoin. I think it's going to be really important. I want to make sure that it's you know, very carefully regulated. And I want to make sure this is on your, on your, on your radar. Mm -hmm. But the feedback I got in the thread, so this is directly from, you know, at least this particular Bitcoin community, was, uh, well, maybe they, you should try offering them to uh, campaign uh, donations in Bitcoin <laughs> instead, because the only thing they care about is money. Uh, and I, uh, the next five or six replies were kind of an echo of that, and I kind like of... fire with fire, I guess? Yeah, and I felt a little bit chagrined about that, because uh, I, I do feel that it's important, I mean, obviously, uh, uh, campaign finance is very important. Uh, However, I do think that direct action is also important. We've seen uh, direct action be uh, at least influenced uh, uh, discussion leading up to the uh, presidential uh, re-election, uh, election uh, this past year. Uh, so I do think there's opportunity for that, but it seems like there's a little bit of um, uh, people are, are not sure that that will actually work. And okay. I, I do think that people should be trying. Jerry? Um, so I think there may well come a time in the future where uh, that is gonna be necessary. Um, where some folks might want to give campaign contributions to people who are champions of, of Bitcoin. Um, but I think we're a little ways from that. And right now, what's really, really missing in D.C. is education. More than anything, mm -hmm. folks on the Hill, members of Congress, um, their staffers who are advising them, um, don't know what Bitcoin is and don't mm -hmm. understand it and don't understand what bucket it fits in, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, so when we talk about lobbying, Congress on behalf, on behalf of Bitcoin, it's really education. It's really just explaining what the technology is to them. As to um, collaboratively doing this, I mean, it's something that independently um, I've been trying to do at Mercatus. We have a uh, Bitcoin uh, primer for policymakers coming out very soon. We're going to get to the Hill. Um, and do you have an actual website? That oh, it'll be at mercatus.org okay. when that's up. Um, at the end of, the, of this month, I have a briefing uh, with the Senate Homeland uh, Security and Government Affairs Committee on Bitcoin. They are interested in just learning more about it, okay. and I'm going to go and do that. But most importantly is that just yesterday the Bitcoin Foundation announced that they are looking for a D.C.-based full-time attorney to be a representative in D.C. Okay. doing this kind of work. And I think that's going to be the point of collaboration between all of our groups um, uh, to get the, you know, the right education about Bitcoin down in D.C. Very good, very good. Okay, well, would you, would you want to add something, Rain? Um, well, so I think that 
I think that the only couple things I want to add, you know, I've, I've gone to D.C. and I've lobbied and I have real mixed feelings about how effective it is. I agree with that it is an education problem that most lawmakers don't understand mm -hmm. Bitcoin. Uh, they just really don't have the technology teams available to them. Um, and there's a really big difference. You know, they, I've talked to staffers on the Hill and they say, you know, big companies with a lot of uh, money and who care about policy, they are coming in here with teams of 10 and 15 attorneys. We have to get bigger conference rooms because we can't fit them into our normal conference rooms. And they're coming in once a week and they're trying to meet with us. This is an incredible investment that some people are willing to make to influence policy sure. uh, on the Hill. Uh, as, a, as one lone civil liberties person who goes there once in a while and is generally based in San Francisco, that can be uh, really frustrating because the people who are most affected by the policies are often the ones whose voices yeah. they aren't heard. Individual constituents can make the difference. We made the difference with SOPA. We can make the difference in future legislation. I am convinced that uh, when they get phone calls, and I've heard this from tons of them, I've spoken to staffers repeatedly, and they notice when the phone is ring ringing off the hook. They notice when people are willing to go and meet with them in person. Um, I think that the threats to Bitcoin are not going to be called Banned Bitcoin Act of 2013. They're going to be slipped into some other piece of legislation. It's going to be something that uh, most people will think is a good bill because it's going after child pornography or terrorism or whatever. And it's going to have some terrible implication for uh, the Bitcoin community and for financial privacy and for financial freedom of speech. And that's where we've got to fight it. And uh, so that's when we need phone calls and letters to legislators and going and physically meeting with them because that makes all the difference in the world. Uh, and uh, again, we have beat them with SOPA. We've pushed back so hard on CISPA that I'm not even sure they're coming back for a fight this year. Uh, so it, it can happen. Excellent. Can, can I say, Ted, that I, I think we absolutely have to be prepared to fight that fight if and when that day comes. I think that right now it is so early that mm -hmm. Um, one or two or a few voices can make a difference because at this point they're just looking to understand what Bitcoin is mm -hmm. and we're not at the point yet though we may s well uh, be very soon that it will be the financial industry it'll be the banks it'll be the credit card companies payment processors who are going to send our lobbyists in to educate them on what Bitcoin is mm -hmm. right and it'll be the child safety advocates who will be in there educating them on what Bitcoin is we have an opportunity now before that happens for the Bitcoin community to explain to members of Congress what Bitcoin is. Excellent. Thank you. Do you want to add something, Joe? I, I did, and I have a request as well. Oh, so, please. yeah, so so I'll add my... Then, then we'll get to the question. Yeah, so, so, the, so the one thing I did... We're right now, but... <clears throat> the one thing I did want to add is, you know, I wanted to be a little more specific. So um, when we say, well, what are you going to do to influence it? Well, uh, against what, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, against what problem? And I think... You gotta you gotta understand your adversary before you understand before you formulate a plan. And, and one problem is the issuance of guidance that's ill fated, yeah. right? Like this guidance that came out about virtual currency does not reflect the the reality of the facts of what Bitcoin and virtual currency is. Okay, so so one of the things that needs to happen is I think that one form of collaboration that people could consider is principled legal challenges to guidance like that that says this does not either you either challenge it procedurally or you challenge it on its merits or you or you you know you, there are things that can be done. The second thing is to go and seek letter rulings from your state regulators so that it doesn't spread out to have every state try to regulate it as well as as, as has happened with money transmission. And the third thing was already talked about, which is as soon as, as soon as you keep growing the business on the other side to involve big heavyweight partners, they will lobby for us. <laughs> you know, as soon as, as soon as the big heavyweights are in and they're using their influence, getting the people to Washington won't be a problem. But there's a, when I first heard about Bitcoin, I, I, this is a funny story and it's, it's worth telling, it's short. <laughs> I, I had just finished um, in my internet enforcement practice fighting a, a botnet that had been, taken over a client's group of users and some, some people had built them out of some personal information and then gotten a hold of their financial information and stolen about $23 million worth of money from people's credit cards, $1 at a time across 23 million people's credit cards. And my client was, um, they, their, their network was one of the principal networks on which this botnet functioned. The way that functioned, now listen carefully, the way that that crime occurred was they duped a bunch of people into believing that by downloading a little piece of software that did some computational analysis on their computer and gave them a nice result, 
they could have a thing, a, a cookie, a, a carrot, a, a nice, they could see a video or whatever. What it really did was it downloaded a piece of software that ran in the background and solved algorithmic problems for them. And what they were doing with that software was linking together a bunch of computers to crack codes and to crack, um, you know, socket layer security and other kinds of things, and they were able to decrypt uh, credit card traffic and steal the data. So when I heard someone describe the concept of mining Bitcoin, <laughs> I was like, this, this is a crime. <laughs> that, was, that was my first, I mean, here I am speaking on the panel, right? That was the first, my first reaction was, who invented this? Because this is a wicked good botnet, <laughs> right? And the, those of you who are technologically savvy understand what I'm talking about from the surface. I said, whoever's behind this, I mean, they are, they're saying, oh, you can mine money. Well, that's the best way to get people to download the stuff on your computer, right? <laughs> And, and I thought to myself, well, who's giving these mysterious problems to solve for the computer to you know, use its processing power to mine them? I didn't know what it was, sure. but I'm not stupid. And I was like, tell me more because I don't think this is what you guys think it is. Now, I, I've been dissuaded of that now. I understand what it is now, but, but this is what you're combating on the Hill. You can even have people who know a lot of things about technology that will take one bite at Bitcoin for the first time and go, that looks like a crime to me before you even get to talk about its benefits. Mm -hmm. So you, you really, I mean, Jared is right on, that we're at the very, very front end of this conversation. And, and so my suggestion though, Scott, is, is, um, is I think a lot of people are here to hear about what do I do about financial privacy. Sure. And so if it's okay to take one or two minutes if that's okay to, to sort of, I had prepared one thing just from the lawyer's perspective about sure, what, please, you know, please, when I sure have, would, people would benefit from that. when I have clients come to me and say, all right, I've designed this really slick piece of software. Here's what I want to do with it. Here's my biggest complaint as a lawyer. So those of you who are going to go get legal counsel, you know, you can save a lot of money by doing this. They get to me and they say, here's my data flows. And they just plop a big mess of technical data in front of me. And the biggest complaint I have as a lawyer, trying to merge their technological whiz-bang gizmo to archaic Stone Age law, is that they're speaking in engineering code, and I need to speak in legal code. And so when we talk about giving the, law, the lawyers or the regulators or Congress or you know, whoever it is who's breathing down your neck for compliance information, what I usually get in is a document that shows the box that talks to the box that talks to the box that talks back to the box that talks back to the box, and there's the, the, the customer. That makes sense to me because I've spent some time understanding it. It doesn't make sense to a, a regulator. They want to know what person talked to what legal entity who shared information with what legal entity who shared information back with what legal entity who gave someone a service. So if you want to save yourself like $10,000 worth of legal fees, give that document to your lawyer. Right? Because that's the first thing that he or she has to do is, is basically reinterpret your data flow to match the law, which is an entity is governed by a law, this other entity is governed by a different law, and you're sharing data back and forth. That's how privacy works. And so um, you've got to follow the entity, the data, and the money. So you've got to really define which legal entities are involved, what data, where this is a privacy forum, so what data is each person sharing with whom, and who's the steward of the data? What's their job, and who's keeping it, and who's sharing it? And then you've got to follow the money so that you understand the financial laws. Um, the other thing you've got to do is you really, you really have to understand that you are bound by the legal definitions. You can't change them. That was the topic of the last panel. I mean, Dax said it in the last panel. He said, you can't change the fact that the definition says what it says. The only way you change that is you lobby to get it changed legislatively, you challenge it in court and get it changed judicially, or you commit a crime. That there's no, there's no like middle ground. You can't like this idea that you go out and non-comply for six months while you get enough venture funding to then turn around and get your licenses or comply is, is in, my, in my humble opinion, dangerous, right? Because these, these, these regulators will retroactively fine you for things that you've done in the past. It's not like they come to you and say, oh, well, fix it and you'll be okay. Um, but you know, the, the one last piece is this, this idea of what, 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 what kind of coalition can we build? You know, um, Rainy mentioned Kalia. You might not even know what Kalia is. I'll put it very simply. Kalia is an edict from the government that telecommunication companies have to build boxes that snoop your traffic. That's what it is. They, they, they literally force telecommunication companies to build wiretaps into their system. 
And, and so one of the pieces, the reason Rainer brought it up is we, we want to definitely make sure that um, if that hint comes our way to have financial institutions tap financial traffic that we resist it because that's very antithetical to the concept of what we're doing here. Great. Well, thank you very much, panel. Um, let's quickly turn to the questioners who've been patiently waiting. Appreciate it. So please, can you state your name and then your uh, question? Please. Yeah, my name is Matt Hollander and I'm a Bitcoin developer. Um, I was kind of wondering about uh, buying and selling Bitcoin in the FinCEN gui guidelines. Um, what, what I don't get is if they, they want it to be considered a money transmitter. If I were to say be a pawn shop and buy and sell gold, um, how, how is that different than buying and selling a digital currency? And if, if I kind of put it in two parts, if you were, say, Lamassu or Bitcoin ATM or Robocoin, if you were to try to build a business model that actually sold Bitcoin, um, would going both ways be easier or be harder to do legally than just selling Bitcoin? Um, how is selling Bitcoin more than $1,000 a day illegal? And kind of where is FinCEN coming from doing that? Yeah, I'm going to direct that to Joe, I think, probably because you, you've got the legal background. Could you? S simple answer. Um, at, at, you know, at the state level, um, the, there are four kinds of financial service, four buckets of financial service regulation. You can either transmit money, you can exchange currency, you can sell a payment instrument, or you can issue or redeem stored value or prepaid access. Okay? Money transmission is from you to another person or to another location. That's not an ATM, right? Um, sale of a payment instrument is you take cash in, you give, a, you give an instrument out. Currency exchange is the other way around, is you take a payment instrument in and you give currency out, or you exchange two kinds of currency. Is, is Bitcoin a payment? Uh, payment what did you say that was? Well, that, that, I'm getting there. So the, so the question is, does a state money transmission law that says if I give you yen and you charge me a little fee and give me dollars, how is that different than I give you dollars, you charge me a little fee and you give me Bitcoin? And it all turns on whether the state statute defines currency, taking money in exchange for currency, defines currency as either fiat currency, which is like paper and coin, or virtual currency. Right now, I mean, we're looking at that question right now in the firm. And um, the answer is the state laws generally mean fiat currency, but only one state so far that I've seen has actually said it. So it's, it's unclear. And that's where I go back to go get a letter ruling. C write the, the regulator and say, tell me that currency means money and paper and not Bitcoin. OK. Hard question. Thank you for asking. Yes, can you state your name and uh, question? Yeah, my name is Mike. I'm also a Bitcoin developer. This is a sort of question for maybe Joe and Rainey. One of the things we've, uh, or I've been talking about with some other developers is um, the chance that people who write wallet software might be forced by a court order to push updates which freeze people's funds or seize their money. And um, one of the things we've been discussing as a way to uh, raise the bar a little bit for that is to split um, signing of updates across multiple people in different jurisdictions. Right, so. If one country, if one court in Germany, for example, uh, wants to do this, they would have to get the cooperation of Swiss government, British government, other places like that. This isn't really something about the US who will just sort of roll over the allies or whatever, but it can help a lot with small countries. So I was wondering what you think about, you know, is this, would this be considered a uh, way to evade um, subpoena power and things like that, or is this actually a pretty reasonable thing to do? It's got security uh, impacts as well, right? You don't want single individuals to get kidnapped or uh, hacked or, or threatened in some way like that. And, uh, yeah, and Joe, do you want to talk about that? And maybe Rainy, you want to talk about maybe if you have any cases? I certainly wouldn't call that? it um, evading <laughs> jurisdiction if you were giving it a name. That's a bad marketing tool. <laughs> 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 Joe, do you want to grab that? I, 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 said, I said it earlier. You know, for me, the smell test is it needs to have a different commercial purpose. Mm -hmm. if, if, if it has commercial utility that's, that you can defend, and, and, you know, and you really are developing it to be a benefit other than just to avoid jurisdiction, then you have a defense. Now, I, don't, I can't sit here and tell you in front of everybody that, as legal advice that that would be sufficient. But, but I can say that if, if you were in my office and we were talking about strategies, my first question is, are you just doing this to avoid subpoenas? Because if you are, I'm going to tell you not to do it. But if it's a way to get a lot of benefits and it happens to have the side benefit of you know, making it, making the legal process required to obtain the information more challenging, 
I, I don't think that you are obligated by law to like give people or give the government data on a silver platter. Do you want to think that right? Well, I would argue that there would probably be a number of benefits other than evading jurisdiction at a particular place. Yeah, right. It's also for like safety of the developers. Right. Well. So, for example, if Gavin gets kidnapped and somebody's going to break his knees, and he's, you know, or unless he immediately stands up and tells everybody in the community to do this one important thing, you know, that, like that's a scenario that I don't want. I'm pretty sure Gavin doesn't want. I'm sure the rest of us don't want. There's a, there's, you know, I think we built or people built Bitcoin to be extremely decentralized, right? So we need to think as it becomes a real network, that it's really getting widespread adoption. Where are the points of centralizations? Where are the points of potential censorship? We've seen historically how monetary systems have been used to shut off accounts or been used for political reasons that we are very uncomfortable with, that have been used to cut off, honestly, speech that should be protected by the First Amendment. Um, so where, where can we put in safeguards now, while it's still relatively early in the Bitcoin lifespan, to ensure that there are protections against any uh, real honing in or pressure points that allow one weak link to affect the rest of the Bitcoin community? Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Your question. Uh, name, question, please. Sure. My name is uh, Fred Conklin. Uh, this question is actually probably addressed mostly to Mr. Brito, as you're the primary voice that is heard by the legislatures. Um, <laughs> Don't listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that sort of defeats my question, and that is, what can you do to make sure that these two um, acts that are coming up actually protect individual freedom? And then the second question is, what can you do right now entrepreneurs and startups have this issue of they don't have enough money to comply and can you create some form of provisional system where they don't necessarily fully comply but are in the path to compliance Great right question. so let me take the second question first i you know in the last panel they were pretty clear there is no provisional license i think that Looking down the road, looking at the Bitcoin Foundation, having somebody in D.C. Uh, representing the interests of the Bitcoin community, something uh, that might be of interest to the Bitcoin community would be federal preemption of state uh, money uh, service mm -hmm. uh, licensing. Um, so I would throw that out there. That would, you know, be not be easy to accomplish, but something that, could, especially the financial industry, um, is a partner. Um, to get to the first question, you were talking about what can be done about the two acts. You mean the Kalia and ECPA reform? So uh, I would say, Rainey, you could probably answer that better than me. I think sort of um, uh, where we're complementary is we're try we try to educate them at the really early stage, and then when it gets to where it's, uh, the votes are pending, this is where EFF really um, gets the troops uh, going. So I think you would say uh, call your member, right? Right. Um, so with you know, with the ECPA update, it's actually, it's actually a good thing. We actually do want them to update ECPA. The, you know, ECPA was passed in 1986, and uh, there's a lot of uh, uncertainty about whether or not it requires a warrant for email or a warrant for data in the cloud or warrant for location information. So the idea was to update it so those three things would be covered. The problem is that the update that they have suggested is going to cover one of them, but not totally. And maybe they're going to add this new special emergency provision. So I think that it's very important um, for users to speak out now. Um, the problem is it's a tricky situation because people are trying to do the right thing and update this law the way we've been asking them to for so many years and do it in a smart way that's going to make everybody happy, but the end result is arguably only as good as what we've already established in case law. So um, I think EFF's role of all the people who are fighting on, on ECBA reform right now is pushing them to go further than they have uh, suggested they would and actually do something that's going to be actually meaningful. Uh, with Kalia, so here's what's going on with Kalia right now, and Seth is actually somebody who should talk to you about this. Um, with Kalia, they're not going to introduce a bill until they think they've got close to the votes they need, is our sense. They've been talking about updating Kalia for a number of years right now, which means that, unfortunately, the way you know my activism team tends to work is they introduce a bill and we get everybody riled up and we get people speaking out on Reddit and we, we generate a ton of phone calls and a ton of action and people speak out and we stop it. And that's, that works pretty well. Um, problem is they haven't introduced it yet, so it's very hard for us to fight back against it when they're waiting to introduce it until they've already secured the 
get the votes they need. So what we're doing instead is starting to blog about it and talk about it and get reporters interested in it, get people talking about it now so it becomes so toxic that they don't even bring it up. And can I, and can I say one thing? Oh, that, yes. Do you mind if we... <laughs> okay, never mind. We, we only have two minutes left, so it, we, we have two people standing. So if... We're putting the pressure on you, I'm sorry. <laughs> but if you can make it, you know, you name, question quick, and then we can try right, to get it quickly and get the last person. Um, uh, in my libertarian heart, I, would, I, I think the world would be a more just place if governments just plain didn't exist. But you know, as a practical matter, they're here, we have to deal with them. So um, the, the way to reduce the scope of that is to get involved, right? So I've done that. I'm now vice chair of Boulder County Republicans. Um, I, Rob brought up earlier campaign financing, and I'm looking at this, this presents a real problem because once you give out your public key, anybody, you can't stop anybody from making a payment to that key, right? It gets published. <laughs> well, campaign finance laws state wow. that every, uh, every contribution, you have to record the person's identity along with their occupation and uh, um, line of work. And I'm wondering, does, it seems like an insoluble problem. I mean, how do... But then nobody but you, can then make how do you make it? it. And then they can give it to somebody else, and they can give it to somebody but you're, else. But you're right. And we'll have somebody answer the question real quick, but that's a fantastic question. And we're all writing it down because I don't think anybody's considered that yet. So, you know, is there an answer? Uh, so I'm having a blast at Bitcoin 2013. Precisely because I'm getting all of these novel questions I've never thought about, <laughs> and this is a great question. for policymakers that I'm thinking of is just getting longer and longer. That's a fantastic question. I I, I imagine there's going to be look. I mean, I think I think somebody could probably come up with a system to uh, allow for Bitcoin donations to a politician without uh, you know making it so you can't control. Uh, there probably is some technical fix. I got but, a, I got an idea. Yeah. Okay, so one would be throw out all Bitcoin or donate to EFF that you can't get a validated identity out of. So if the wallet address receives payment and you don't have validated identity associated with the sending wallet address, hey, send that to EFF. We're not, we're, right. we can't take that money. So you could or actually maybe have some third like party. the Bitcoin faucet or somebody. Yeah. Faucet, yeah, yeah. your yeah. local not representative that we has a faucet. Not take your donations, which we will, <laughs> um, but I just think, you know, I, anyway. Reject it. And then just with Bitcoin. a note saying, please contribute to this to political kind, kind of, of, yeah. Right. So that may be a, a scapegoat. Is send it and send a note. <laughs> Thank you. Good question, by the way. Very good question. Yes, please. Uh, I'm Carol Van Cleef. I'm with Pat and Boggs. Uh, I am a lawyer in the room. I am a Washington, D.C. lawyer. And for those of you who may or may not know, Pat and Boggs is also known as the number one public policy law firm in the country. Um, I work with our public policy people. I don't do that myself, but we work closely together. That's not an advertisement for <laughs> the lawyer you're looking for, but I'm here at the conference, and how many uh, Washington lawyers are here at the conference? Uh, having said that, organization now is critical. It is absolutely critical. It is not something you can wait into the future until the issues start to come up. I can give you the example of the prepaid industry, mm -hmm. that going back about six or seven years ago now, they took the steps to start to organize and put together a trade association um, that has been there for the last seven years working to shape the public policy issues around the product. And they've done a pretty good job. Perfect? No, but the legislative process is not a perfect process by any means. And we always tell our clients you have to have, you know, besides working with the trade association, if you've got something really important to protect, you need to have your own counsel at the table to protect it in that setting. That's another piece here. But what's very important is that the privacy issues, yes, I, I hear what you're saying, and yes, they are important issues, but we've got, I've been in in the last three weeks on digitized currencies before the Federal Reserve Board. I've been before the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. We have the FCC. We have FinCEN. And I put FinCEN fairly far down on that list, plus we all have all the states to deal with. There are a lot of issues right now, and the industry has to figure out with, and I know it's still in a nascent stage in many ways, but figure out what the agenda is, put down the issues, to have a, have a, you need to have a, some sort of a, a consultative process to get started in fleshing out what are gonna be the key points to deal with it, because quite honestly, not a moment to be lost because there's so much press around Bitcoins now, it's being paid attention to in all areas of Washington, and I would strongly urge folks to really think hard about pulling this together. I'd be glad to be part of the uh, activity. Excellent. Scott? Yeah, I think we, we have got to conclude here. So.
just very good. Um, I think that's the open-ended questions that we got to really make a coalition to basically push our agenda because it is an agenda and we want to push it. We want this thing to be here. So thank you for the panel.